But there is a statement about the self which might seem to conflict with this. Both the ancient lore and the sage tell us that reality dwells in the heart. The sage also tells us that Jesus meant the same thing when he said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. This, at the first thought, seems to imply that the real self is in relativity and is even of atomic size, being confined within a space no bigger than a man's thumb. But this is not intended to be taken in a literal sense, for we are told also that the infinite sky, together with all the worlds, is inside that small space. The purpose of the teaching is that the self, Atman, must be sought and found by turning inwards, away from the world. This we shall see in the next chapter. We are told by the sage, quoting from the Yoga of Hasistam, that the heart is meant not the lump of flesh called by that name, but the real self, Atman, the original consciousness. It is called the heart because it is the source of intelligence from which the mind takes its rise and expands into the world. To that source it must return, so that relativity may be wound up and may cease. When the mind with life returns to the heart and stays there in unity with the heart, then the mind can no more project on the self the world appearance which conceals it. From this it follows that the sage does not see the world, though he rarely says so, having regard to the weaknesses of questioners. This we shall see later when discussing the questions that concern the sage. The self is therefore, in a sense, the all. It is spoken of as the totality, in which the worlds and creatures are fractions, though in absolute truth it has no fractions. Thus to gain the self is to gain the all. The sacred lore tells us that which is infinite is happiness. In the finite there is no happiness. And the sage also tells us the self alone is great. All else is infinitesimally small. We do not see anything whatever other than the self for which we may sell the self. We are here reminded of the saying of Jesus when he said, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his own self? For a very, very small price, the surrender of the ego, this infinitely great one, Atman, the self, is to be had. But this small price has to be paid. And yet it happens that, that men are afraid of this state. They are not afraid of the ego-ridden existence, which is the source of all their fears, because they believe the ego to be themselves and know not the real self. They are afraid that if they lose the ego, they themselves shall cease to be. They are afraid and unafraid of the wrong things. They are afraid of fearlessness, which is really egolessness, and unafraid of fear, which is the ego. That the loss of the ego is no loss ought to be clear to them from their experience of the happiness of sleep. No one is afraid to go to sleep, says the sage, though it is egoless. So why should one be afraid to lose the ego, which is the cause of all fear once and for all, and thereby win fearlessness? This natural state needs to be distinguished from the yogi's trance, which is called samadhi. This we are told by the sage of Arunachala. And there are various kinds of trance or samadhi. The highest is called the trance without thought or nirvakalpa samadhi. The description without thought applies also to the natural state. 
The yogic trance is called Kavala Nirvakalpa Samadhi. The natural state is called the Sahaja Nirvakalpa Samadhi. Sahaja means natural. This alone is the state of liberation, mukti, deliverance, not the other. The distinction is brought out by the sage's answer to a question. When a disciple asked him, saying, I am convinced that one that is in the nirvakalpa samadhi remains unmoved by any activity of the body or the mind. And I base my opinion on my observation of your state. Someone else maintains that samadhi and bodily activity are mutually incompatible and cannot coexist. Which of these views is correct? And the sage of Arunachala answered, both of you are right. There are two nirvakalpa samadhis. One is called the natural state, or sahaja nirvakalpa samadhi, or just simply sahaja. The other is called kavala nirvakalpa samadhi. Your view concerns the former. The other view concerns the latter. The difference between them is this. In the former, the mind is dissolved and lost in the self. And being so lost, it cannot revive, and hence there is an end of bondage. In the latter case, the mind is not dissolved and lost in the self. It is immersed in the light of consciousness, which is the self. And while it is so immersed, the yogi who is in that nirvakalpa samadhi of the kavala type enjoys great happiness. But since the mind remains distinct from the self, it can and does become active again, and the yogi becomes subject to ignorance and bondage. He that has won the natural state sahaja is the stage, is the sage. He is free once and for all, and cannot become bound again. The difference is illustrated thus. The mind of the sage that has attained the natural state is like a river that has joined the ocean and becomes one with it. It does not return. The mind of the yogi that is in the yogic samadhi is like a bucket let down by a rope into a well where it remains submerged in the water. By the rope, it can be pulled up again, so the mind of the yogi can go back to the world. And thus, he is not free, and he is very much like common men. The yogi's mind in samadhi is like the mind of a sleeper in sleep, with this difference, that while the sleeper's mind is immersed in darkness, that of the yogi is immersed in the light of the self. The sage, that is the one whose mind has become dissolved into the self, is not affected by the world in any way, though to all outward appearance, he that is, that is his body and mind, may be active in the world. His activities are like the eating of a meal by a somnolent child who is being fed by the mother, or like the movements of a carriage in which the driver is asleep. We shall come to this point later on. It is thus clear that only the one that has won the natural state, that is, the one that has become egoless, can become a teacher of the truth about the self to others, not the mere yogi who has won kavala nirvakalpa. That the attainment of the latter does not make one free is illustrated by the sage, by the instance of a yogi who had attained this samadhi and was able to plunge into it by effort and remain in it years at a time. But once he came out of samadhi and felt thirsty, his disciple being near him, he told him to fetch water. But the disciple was long in bringing the water, 
and the yogi dived into samadhi again. Centuries passed, during which the sovereignty of the land passed from Hindus to Muslims, and from Muslims to the British. And at last the yogi awoke, and his first thought was that his disciple would have brought the water. So he just called out, have you brought me the water? Here clearly the mind was surviving in latency during the samadhi and resumed its activity just from where it left off. While the mind survives, there is no mukti, no liberation or true deliverance. It seems likely that the natural state may come after repeated experience of the other state for some months or years. The mind might get worn away little by little in this way, just as a doll of sugar immersed again and again in a sea of sugarcane juice might get worn away until nothing is left of it. We are now able to answer a question which was raised and answered long ago in the ancient lore. This question might have occurred to the reader also, or the listener. The state of deliverance is egoless. So is deep sleep. So it would seem as if one can become free by merely going to sleep. But it is not so. No one becomes free by going to sleep. When he awakes, he finds himself as much in bondage as ever before. We have seen that even the yogi, when he comes out of his trance, called samadhi, is in the same predicament. The question is, why does not the sleeper who becomes egoless in sleep stay egoless? Why does the ego revive again on waking? Before we consider the answer, we may notice another feature of sleep, which we find from Revelation. Not only is sleep not the gateway to deliverance, it is also an obstacle to it. We shall see later on that if the seeker of the self falls asleep while engaged in the quest, he has to begin over again on waking. Only if he keeps wide awake all the time and persists actively in the quest till the revelation of the self takes place, does he become totally free from bondage. We find this indicated in the third part of one of the Upanishads, where we are told that Bhrigu, who received his teaching from his father Varuna, obtained experience of the real self, therein named bliss or ananda, straight away from the sheath of the intellect. He did not shed that sheath and became lost in the sheath of bliss, the ananda maya which would have meant falling asleep. This last sheath, the causal body, is not separately transcended, but only along with the sheath of intelligence. When this question was put to the sage, he referred to the Upanishadic lore where the question is answered. There is a vital difference between the two states. The sage enters the egoless state by the utter and final extinction of the ego, which is the primary ignorance. In the language of relativity, he is said to lose contact with the subtle and gross bodies by the dissolution of the causal body, otherwise called the sheath of happiness, which is just this primary ignorance. He passes straight away from the waking state through the extinction of the ego to the egoless state, which is beyond relativity. Hence, it is clear that the sage becomes free from the causal body. But for this body, there is no sort of connection between the real self, which the sage is, and the other bodies. And therefore, he is bodiless and mindless. The case of the common man going to sleep is quite different. His causal body, the primary ignorance, is not dissolved. Into it, the ego and mind are merged and remain there in seed form until the time of waking. The mind having become quiescent, there is happiness and sleep. But this happiness bears no comparison whatever with that of the egoless state. The sage tells us, The happiness of sleep 
is like the meager light of the moon that passes through the thick foliage of a tree and lights up the ground beneath. But the happiness of the sage is like the unobstructed moonlight that falls on open ground. This vital difference between the sleeper and the sage is illustrated in the ancient lore by the analogy of an ordeal by fire in which an accused person took hold of a red-hot axe, making protestation of his innocence. If he was burnt, he was adjudged guilty and punished. If he was not burnt, he was declared innocent and set free. Here the guilty man got burnt because he covered himself with a lie when he grasped a burning iron. The innocent one was not burnt because he covered himself with the truth which protected him from being burnt. In the same way, the common man goes into union with reality and sleep, covering himself with the false knowledge, I am the body. Thereby he is a liar, and by that lie he is thrown out and is returned to bondage. The sage becomes one with reality, covering himself with right knowledge, that is, giving up the ego sense and is not thrown out.